Eh, buenos días, eh, sí, yo soy Navid Shekol. Sí hablo español, pero la charla la vamos a hacer en inglés porque en español no, no me sentiría muy, sentiría muy cómodo. Pero por uh, la fase de preguntas, si quieren hacerla en español, no es un problema para mí. Entonces, bueno, hoy vamos a hablar de, um, de mi trabajo en Facebook. Yo soy un production engineer, uh, trabajo en la oficina de, de Mello Park en California. Um, también soy un desarrollador Python desde el 2005, más o menos, entonces son uh, unos añitos ya. Ah, I said I was going to do it in English, so, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I forgot. Uh, so, yeah, the, um, uh, what I want to talk to you about today is um, uh, how we do automation uh, at Facebook, and uh, this is automation at scale. Uh, as I'm sure you can imagine, we have a lot of servers, and uh, we use... Some, something called Facebook Job Engine, which is a service that we have uh, developed um, in the past few years, myself and my team, um, which is a framework that different teams use within Facebook to implement automation. Um, so before we get into the details about what the service is and what it does, uh, I would like to explain why automation is so important for us. Um, we almost, almost never do manual work on, on our servers. Um, the reason for that is that, uh, well, there's many reasons. Uh, we have a, a very large number of servers, as I'm sure you, you can appreciate. And um, um, also, uh, automation gives us uh, a very um, repeatable and predictable way uh, to perform actions on, on these servers. Um, if we were to do these things manually, it would be hard to do it exactly in the same way every time, right? So it would also uh, not scale because we have a limited number of engineers and we have a very large number of servers and that keeps growing every time. So using automation, which effectively means writing code to do things on the infrastructure, um, also fits in well with everything else we do because if we're writing code for, for managing our servers, uh, we can use the same tools that we normally use for doing other type of development. Uh, so that means that we can also use the same um, techniques such as uh, te testing and code reviews to ensure that the quality of our uh, automation is good. And we can also use code reviews to validate that our plans are good. So if we want to do <clears throat> a kernel rollout on the infrastructure or whatever it is that we're trying to do, we can write code and we can ask other people to provide feedback in the code itself. <clears throat> um, we run millions of jobs uh, every day. Um, and uh, the cumulative runtime of these jobs, we're talking about many uh, many years, sometimes hundreds of years, compacted in a single day, right? If you sum it all up, all these different jobs that run in parallel. Just to give you some examples of what workflows have been implemented on top of this platform, um, we're talking about kernel and firmware upgrades. Uh, we're talking about provisioning uh, new servers. You know, when they come in, they get unpacked and put on the rack. We kick off automation that is based on FBJE to set the servers up and put all the required software on them and bring them into production so that they can start serving cat pictures to our users. Um, we also do something called auto remediation. So this is uh, every time an alarm fires, um, automation kicks off on this framework to go and remediate this alarm, so to fix the problem if it's possible. There is actually a separate talk about this particular subject if, if you're interested. Um, you can search it on Google, um, on YouTube, uh, FBART, it's called. We use it for distributing SSL certificates on the fleet uh, of uh, web servers that eventually serve Facebook.com or Instagram as well, right? Uh, WhatsApp. Um, we also use this framework for distributing binaries on the fleet. So there's many, many more exa examples, but this is just a taste of the sort of things that you can build if you have a framework like this. So let's go through an actual example of why we thought that we needed uh, to build such a system. Let's say you have um, a very large uh, fleet of servers. Uh, we're not talking about, you know, a couple of servers, we're talking about, again, 
thousands and thousands, perhaps millions of servers, right? <clears throat> and you have a very complicated workflow that you want to execute to upgrade every single server on the fleet. You don't want to do this all at once in parallel on all the servers, right? This is, it would be a problem because if you do something wrong, if the software you're installing contains bug, you would be, uh, you would damage the entire fleet. So you want to do certain things and then you want to check, you need to wait. Uh, for example, a kernel upgrade. Typically, you would want to install it, uh, then you want to reboot the machine, right? You want to bring it back up, you want to make sure that uh, the, the machine is healthy, it's able to serve the same amount of requests that it was able to serve a day before with a different type of kernel. You may want to do some A-B testing. Um, so this, what I'm trying to convey here is that even something as simple as installing a kernel, uh, it might sound simple if you do it on, a, on one machine. If you have to do it on a lot of machines, it becomes a very tedious task. And if you want to do, do it at scale, uh, chances are that you want to, that what you're trying to do is going to take a long time to, uh, to complete. Um, if you want to do it in a safe way, um, you want to do it on one machine, then on 10, and you want to scale it up, right? And as this process goes through, it might take days, weeks, or months, you want to be able to monitor uh, the progress of your automation, of your rollout. Um, you want to build something that can run without you being there, because you have better things to do with your life than sitting there and watching a, a screen. So you want to build your automation that uh, in a way that can run without you being around. But if there is any problem, then you get notified so that you can go and see what's going on. Um, so you can leave it running overnight, over the weekend, while you go and spend time with your family. And then if there is a problem, you get a message. Uh, otherwise, you come back on Monday or the following weekend, whatever you were doing is, is done. That would be great, right? Um, and if there is a problem, which there will be, there is always a problem, you want a way to uh, fix whatever is causing that issue and then tell the system, okay, you can continue and retry again from where you left off. You don't want to go back to the beginning. You want to just continue from where you were left, right? Maybe you were at 99%. So you just want to do the 1% and, and be done. So how would you typically do this? You can do it from uh, um, running it from a management host. So you have one server or perhaps even your own laptop, and you can run your scripts from there. Um, so it's good that you're using a script to do whatever you're trying to do. That's already uh, a step uh, forward, but uh, um, there are some challenges there, especially if you want to do it at large scale. Uh, you may not have enough computing power on a single laptop or perhaps even a server to drive all this automation, right? Again, if we're talking about very large numbers, a single computer isn't just going to do it. Um, another problem is, you remember we were talking about being able to follow the progress. Uh, you may have access to that machine, but perhaps your colleagues don't. And they also want to be able to see what is going on. And perhaps you're sick or you're on holiday and they don't have access to the machine. And then you have to give them the password. And uh, that's also a, perhaps a security risk. So we were trying to build a system that would fix all these problems. So um, with different permissions levels. So I, as the owner of the job, can have certain permissions of stopping it, resuming it. Um, and my colleagues could have another level of permission, perhaps view only, where they can just look at the logs. Um, another big problem of using a single uh, server for doing all this is that what happens if it crashes? Let's say you're using Windows and it crashes. What are you going to do, right? Uh, or um, power goes out or so any kind of problem. Um, so you want a system that is resilient to these kind of problems. So in a nutshell, we have uh, three big uh, problems with that model. Uh, hardware volatility, basically your server where you're running it could die, could, uh, the disk could fail, right? You could have any sort of problem. Visibility, you want other people in your team or outside your team to have access to the logs and being able to follow the progress, perhaps even help you uh, running this automation. And another third problem I haven't talked about is the environment. Um, 
the environment on your laptop might be very different from the environment on somebody else's machine. Now, with Python, we have certain way of replicating the running, the runtime environment um, pretty closely, but it's still not perfect, and that's a problem that uh, um, we wanted to solve when we built this uh, uh, centralized system for running automation that we built at Facebook. Um, we also wanted a way to be able to pause and continue our workflows. Um, so to do that, uh, we basically needed to build a system that could be interrupted, right? Uh, we, we, we couldn't just have non-blocking automation. And you're going to see how we build that in a, in a minute. And scalability, again, if you have a very large fleet uh, of machines, of course, this is it, it's especially important for Facebook, for Google, for these kind of companies. But I think uh, it's clear at this point that the trend uh, everywhere is uh, to need more and more computers because we have very demanding uh, um, applications. So uh, like the talk we just heard now, you know, uh, machine learning, this is, this is all very intensive and requires a lot of machines. So okay, let's get to what FBJE actually is. Um, so it's a service that we've built at Facebook to implement scalable automation using Python. So let's start by describing some of the terminology that we use. Uh, a job is uh, what we use to represent uh, a unit of work. It can be large, it can be small, uh, but it's uh, a sequential um, steps of activities that you do in order to complete a certain goal, a certain task. Uh, an example is what I was saying before, upgrading a kernel uh, on a host or draining traffic on one cluster. Um, it's conceptually one thing you want to achieve, right? And it's usually multiple steps, sequential ones. We also have the ability to uh, establish relationship between these jobs in a very similar way to Unix processes where you have a parent-child model. And that's very useful uh, for uh, when you have more complicated workflows to be able to signal uh, events between jobs. So if a parent job is waiting for the child job to do something, perhaps one parent spawns many child jobs and one parent orchestrates the automation of the smaller jobs. Each job will have uh, an input. Uh, we call these entities. It's a freeform set of strings um, that you pass into the job and they will modify somehow the behavior of your job. Uh, this could be a host name, for example, right? If you're upgrading a kernel, again, using that example. But it doesn't have to be that. It could be anything, really, depending what your job does. So let's take a look at how we've actually modeled uh, how you build uh, automation using this FPJ. And this is something you could uh, possibly also emulate if you're looking to build something similar. Um, something that I would like to clarify is that my team builds the framework that, that we're talking about, but then we have many different teams at Facebook that build on top of this framework, right? Like, I don't personally upgrade kernels. I don't personally do any of what I just described. I just build uh, the framework, so uh, the, the engine underneath. Um, so this model has worked quite well for us. Um, the way a team would uh, build automation using Job Engine, it's pretty straightforward. You import a base class, which is Job Handler in this case, and you define a new class. This class will have a unique name, in this case, Upgrade Kernel. And within that class, you put all the logic that you need to complete that, uh, that job. Okay? Uh, every class, every Job Handler class must implement at least the start method, that's, that's the entry point to your automation, to your job. As you can see here, we have uh, other methods as well in our, in our job handler. Um, each method represents a stage of your job. Stages are executed sequentially, right? So as we were saying before, we start from the start method, that's our entry point. And if it's a very simple automation, maybe there's only a single uh, stage and you complete from there. But let's say this job is doing something a bit more, uh, some some, something a little bit more complicated. So in your start method, you would do something. You call an external function. Remember, this is a full Python environment, so you can pretty much do anything you want. 
Uh, if we were doing a kernel upgrade, I imagine do something would probably SSH into the machine, download the kernel, do a yum install, reboot it. I don't know, something like that, right? But the important part is um, the, this job transition object that you see there that we return. By returning that object, we're telling the framework, I'm done, and I want to move on to the next phase, which is uh, the method called next uh, phase. But you might be asking yourself, why are you doing that? Why don't you just call the method, right? Like that would be the Python way of doing this sort of thing. This is how we implemented the non-blocking logic of FBJE. Because if we, if we would call directly next phase from start, it, it would not become interruptible, right? But by returning briefly control to the lower stack, we're able to, to, um, uh, to do a save point in a database, in our case, to store, okay, we've gone this far, we've already executed start, this was the result, now we're moving on to the next stage. So we store all this information very quickly in the database, and we then enter again the next phase. Now, the advantage of doing that is if anything goes wrong, well, first of all, you are going to have logs, and you can see, oh, I did run start, and I can see the logs from there, and I moved on to the next phase, and then there was an exception. Something happened. But you have the guarantee that the first method was actually called, which is not true if you were doing it, uh, if you were calling next stage directly. But you can also do something else. Um, the transition in this case has a zero delay transition, meaning it, it will transition to the next stage immediately without any delay, but that, that could be a delay of uh, a few seconds. It could be a delay of weeks or months or years. You could tell the engine, I'm done with the first phase, wake me up again in one year and let me do the second phase. You could actually do this. So as I was saying before, every time we transition, we store the, the state information in a database. And if there is a delay between stages, we are able to reschedule the job at a later time. Now, the uh, powerful part of this is that, uh, remember we were talking about hardware volatility, volatility, what if the server disappears from the face of the earth, what do we do? Well, this is able to tolerate that because when the time comes for the job to run, we're just gonna schedule it on a different machine, right? But what that also means is that the next process that will execute that job will be a different process from the one before. So that's a challenge, right? What, what about your variables and all the things that you had in memory that you, uh, you needed for executing that second stage? So that's a challenge that we have solved. Uh, in a way, I'm going to show you in, in a minute. Um, so this is just a representation of what I was talking about before. Um, executors is what we call the actual processes that, that run the automation. Different teams own different executors. We, my team, doesn't actually own the executors. We just own the job handler class that they import, right? But they are fully responsible of uh, building these binaries, deploying them to production, and uh, updating them as necessary. Uh, we just provide them a compatible API that they need to respect for running this automation. Um, as we were saying before, the executor will pick up the job, execute uh, the stage, and then return control to the back end. The job will go to sleep for a certain amount of time. <clears throat> but then the executor goes away because the machine is, uh, has a problem or just powered off. It doesn't matter. But the job can just be picked up by a different executor. The problem I was talking about before about the memory that you lose in this transition, here's how we solved it. In, in, within your job handler class, you always have access to a self.context uh, dictionary or dictionary-like object. It's not exactly a Python dictionary, but it, it behaves like, like one. Um, so this self.context will be persisted across runs of your job. It doesn't matter if it goes on a different process. And the way we, uh, we implemented that, you can see there to the right uh, an example of uh, a very simple 
proxy-like, uh, sorry, dictionary-like object uh, that in reality will proxy your get and set operations to a persistent storage. In our case, we use something called ZPDB, but just a key value store, okay? Uh, so this is a relatively simple uh, trick that we use, but it, it's quite powerful because, yeah, it solves the problem of uh, uh, persisting data across uh, multiple runs. This key value store will be persisted for as long as the job is alive. <clears throat> so even if the job runs a year later, it's going to have the variables intact, just like it had before. It also automatically handles uh, the serialization of your data. Now, th that there that you see is just an example. It's not the actual logic, right? There's a few things missing there. Serialization is one of them. Your objects in Python are going to be very rich objects. They could be anything, right? <clears throat> so in order for this to work, your objects must be serializable somehow. We tend to prefer using JSON just for compatibility reasons. We don't just have Python at Facebook. We have other languages, and JSON ensures that uh, every different language can still read and write these objects. Uh, but um, yeah, we support other types of serializations as well. Another very important aspect of uh, integrating with FPGA that our users love is the ability to have uh, uh, centralized logging. So uh, just like context, self.context, you also have self.logger. So within your job handler class, you can do self.logger, and you can log different messages about your flow, just like you normally would in any uh, regular Python environment. This is a uh, standard logger object. The difference here is that we have attached a custom logging handler that will not just print the log messages to standard output or error, uh, but it will also make a request to uh, an API that we have, uh, which takes these logs and stores them in a persistent database so that you can access these logs the day after or years later. We actually store these logs in, uh, in Hive, so you can search since uh, logs from five years ago. If you need them, they're still there. We also keep this for auditing reasons, right, for ISO's standards. Uh, for, for for business reasons, let's put it this way. Um, this is a very powerful thing because um, it allows us to uh, give access to the logs to somebody else without, the, without giving them physical access to the machines or to the management server on which you're running. But it does something else that is super useful for us. Um, we are able to auto-generate a lot of alarms and notifications using these alarms. If you're, if you're, we constantly run automation, right? And this automation is going to have different logging levels, info, debug, error, warning, and so forth. And if you run a lot of jobs and you start plotting how often you get errors, you usually pre you get a pretty predictable pattern of, of, of errors. Um, now, using these predictions, then if there is any anomaly, if all of a sudden we get a spike of errors, we can alert people so they can go and see what is going on um, so that they can go and fix the problem. We have another feature uh, that's uh, been very useful, uh, is the ability to um, uh, sort of subscribe to um, uh, events and receive events uh, generated by other jobs. So we use a PubSub for doing this. There's many available PubSub systems uh, in the open source world. We use our own, uh, but there's many out there if you wanted to build something like this. So a job can subscribe to um, events generated by other jobs. For example, a parent job that is creating child jobs that go and update kernels on different machines might want to be notified every time that uh, a machine has been rebooted so they can go there and, um, and install the kernel, for example. A, a reason why this is useful is uh, um, whenever we need to, in the example of a kernel, if you want to do a kernel upgrade, it's actually expensive from a business perspective to take that machine out of production for a certain amount of time, right? 
So we, you want to try to optimize as much as possible to uh, coalesce, to uh, join different maintenance operations uh, all at the same time. So if your machine is uh, going down for reboot for whatever reason, you may want to take advantage of that event and go ahead and install the kernel at that moment so that you don't have to do it twice, right? That one machine means you're saving maybe a dollar. If you're talking about a lot of machines, you're talking about millions of dollars, okay? So you understand why, we, why this is important. Here we have just a, a diagram. I won't spend too much time on this uh, unless you want me to, but uh, it describes a bit the architecture uh, that we've used to build um, FBJE. Um, the important part that I would like to highlight is that there's a lot of different modules, and they all talk to each other using a common protocol called Thrift. And um, this way, we are able to independently update different components uh, without taking down the entire system. In a nutshell, that's the message I'm trying to convey. Um, we have an API, so our users, uh, all the different teams, there's about 60 teams at Facebook that use this system, um, interface with us using an API, and they don't have direct access to the database or to anything like that because we need to run in a secure environment. We try to give our service, uh, our users, a lot of batteries included, we say, meaning a lot of features for free. So instead of you going and building this automation using different scripts, you're going to use FBG because you get a lot of free stuff, right? We talked about the logging, uh, but you also get a lot of pretty dashboards that show how many jobs are executing at any given point, how many errors you have all this sort of uh, information. And again, if you're running at a large scale, uh, it, it makes it a lot easier to do that. It also allows you to aggregate logs. So every time you get an exception, for example, in Python, um, these exceptions are sent to our service. We are able to use some very basic um, machine learning to aggregate these logs uh, together. Uh, and to say, okay, these messages look the same or they're, the stack trace is similar, so they must be uh, the same problem. And then we try to use different uh, features to um, determine what is actually the problem. I'll give you an example. Maybe you notice that the error only happens in one particular cluster. Maybe it's only happening in, uh, in Sweden. Right? So you're like, okay, so there must be a problem in Sweden. I will not even bother looking in other data centers. Um, so yeah, lots of dashboards, as I said before, uh, many alarms every time that, uh, for example, your job have delays. If your job was supposed to run five minutes ago and it's still not running, you're going to get notified somehow that there must be some problem with uh, your execution. And also, um, automatic pushes means that every time you, you commit your code to a repository, um, you, you need to get this code out in production, right? So that typically build means doing testing, uh, running your unit tests, building binaries, packaging them, deploying them on servers, and then restarting the services, making sure they're healthy. It's a lot of work uh, if you do it regularly, right? And you should do it regularly. I highly recommend that you do for your services. Depl deploy often, deploy safely. And, and use automation to deploy. So with FBG, we have actually built, we have built in automation that does continuous deployment of every change that gets landed. Of course, to do this, you need good testing, right? So that if you deploy bad code, your automation is gonna detect it and it's gonna stop and it's gonna let you know your automation is broken. So this is automation pushing automation to production. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of uh, lessons that we've learned through this, uh, the uh, uh, four years that we've been building FPGA. Um, we, uh, I mentioned this before briefly, but we use a shared ownership model, meaning that the executors, which is the binary where the automation actually runs, is owned by all the different teams that use FPGA. We, as the FPGA owners, 
we own the lower part of the stack, you know, the API and the backend, the database and, and everything else. But we all also own a small layer, which is the job handler class that is imported by every executor. So uh, we have this shared ownership model and it's been working very well for us. I understand that this might not apply to your current environment where you may have uh, smaller teams. I, I understand that that's uh, the case, but I think it's important to talk about these uh, uh, the challenges and how we solve them. Because uh, as your company grows, uh, you're probably going to start facing similar challenges. So I think it's important to share these sort of uh, lessons. And from the technical point of view, uh, the uh, some of the lessons we learned is that in the initial design, we were using the database for everything, including uh, as a queuing mechanism. So we literally had a table called queue where we were inserting jobs when they, were, uh, when they had to run, and they had a column saying next run time, where we wanted, when we wanted those jobs to run. Uh, of course, we added an index there to, you know, not to scan the table every time. We, we use MySQL, right, at Facebook. Um, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but it was not a really good idea, especially when you started scaling up. The database just started melting, basically, right? Um, so we eventually switched to using a proper queuing mechanism. Um, in the open source world, we have many uh, you have different types. You have RabbitMQ, you could use Kafka, right? There's so many of these. Um, so yeah, that, that, that was an important uh, lesson that we learned. Um, another important lesson was that we were previously um, synchronously writing to the database one job at a time. Uh, well, in parallel, but each job would be uh, saved in the database in its own database transaction. And uh, this, again, as the number of jobs started increasing, of concurrent jobs, you no longer had one job that was transitioning or completing or retrying. You would have millions of jobs, right, running in parallel. So that, that means millions of transactions trying to concurrently acquire the same locks on your, uh, on your tables. So that, again, did not scale. Um, so the, the, one of the ways that we addressed that uh, was to introduce a buffering layer. Um, so there is a small buffer uh, that receives all the updates that we want to commit to the database, buffers them up, in chunks of maybe 100 or 1,000, depending on what it is that we're trying to do. And then in one session, it will open a transaction to the database and, and make those changes all in one go. Uh, this was a lot lighter on the database to manage because it meant uh, lost a lot less contention on those uh, locks, on those indexes that we needed to acquire. So yeah, that's, that's basically what I, what, what I wanted to talk uh, to you about. Uh, so thank you very much for listening, and uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. <laughs> so yeah, the question is, how does the executor know that um, after start, you, you would want to move to the next phase, and how does it manage that transition? If I understood it correctly, right? Um, so the way that happens is um, uh, that job handler class that you see is actually instantiated and called by a lower stack that we own. Um, so it's, if, you, if you look at the stack trace uh, at that point, that, that, that will be at the bottom, right? Your job handler, your method. So when your start method completes and returns that job transition object, the upper stack, what it does is it will recognize that it's a job transition. Uh, let's say that there is a delay, okay? Uh, which I think is easier to reason about. Um, so we will see, okay, there is a transition, and I will not run this job for the next uh, month. So what I do now is that I, I send this job result to a uh, pipe, uh, so we enqueue it for asynchronous processing. This is uh, over the network, it gets sent, gets sent over the wire, and it gets received by something that in the diagram here... Uh, does not <laughs> appear, so yeah, it's, uh, I cannot show you in the diagram, but yeah, there is a, a process that will receive, that receives all these, uh, we call job results, so it will, it will receive a message that says, okay, job number one, two, three, uh, returned uh, a job transition from stage start, 
wanting to go job next phase in one month. So this information will be taken, saved in the database, so we will find the job row, we will change the next runtime, we will change the next stage, you know, we will store the context, all of that. And the executor at that point actually doesn't care anymore. It forgets entirely. It does garbage collection. It will clean everything up for you. At that point, you could even send a, a SIG kill to that process. It, nobody will, will notice. So that's, that's how you manage it. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. So we actually, within Facebook, we, use, uh, we also use Chef, for example, right? Uh, we use it for slightly different things, though. Um, so. Uh, I, in the examples I gave, I was always talking about uh, you know, upgrading kernels. I just think something that people can relate to more easily. But this being Python, uh, the ways this is being used is just goes beyond doing infrastructure automation, right? You can pretty much implement anything you want. So I guess that's where we have leverage over uh, things like Chef, which is more for, you know, for other things uh, doing operations on your servers. For example, like an example of uh, usage that has nothing to do with the infrastructure is they, they use this system for spawning um, machine learning jobs on, on machines. So they just use this as a, as a way to programmatically create jobs that, that then can use a pool of uh, CPU for doing something and then they send the results of their machine learning back to a centralized server, right? So, you couldn't do things like that with a system like Chef. Yeah, um, yeah, that's basically the reason. <laughs> yeah, the, the interviews are, are a bit challenging, I mean, but uh, they're, not, uh, they're not impossible, because otherwise I would not be there. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm actually happy to speak to you after this if you want. Um, I can give you some pointers. Uh, part of the reason I'm here is that Facebook is hiring, right? We're always looking for software engineers, for production engineers. Um, so if you're interested, uh, you know, find me after this, and I'll give you, uh, you know, my thoughts on the topic. But generally speaking, I think uh, if you if you know your stuff, if you learn, if you're um, if you're willing to spend time learning the sort of uh, challenges and problems that we want to fix and solve. Um, any, anybody can apply, and anybody can also succeed at getting a job in this sort of company. So, Question here. Oh, yeah. Uh, that wanted to ask, you mentioned executors being owned by different teams, and I imagine the code of an executor being like a loop following through every stages of a job handler. So I basically have two questions regarding that. So which portions of an executor need custom code from a team? And also, does a stage in a job handler can execute synchronous calls? Because I imagine if you do that, you will end up blocking the whole loop. So how does that work? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a really good observation and, and question. Yes, so one of the, uh, the contract that we have with our services so I'll address the last part of your question. Yeah. The, the, the contract that we have with our service is that your stage, uh, the code that you put there, you should not block for too long. So definitely don't put a while loop that, that runs forever because that hinders our ability to regain control of the process and, and do all the magic that we do, right? So uh, we, we encourage our users to keep their stages as short as possible. Um, sometimes, you know, it could be they might need to run for a few minutes or perhaps even a few hours, that's okay. But that exposes them, right? The longer you run for, the less ability we have to uh, interrupt you when it's necessary. So, uh, so yeah, the, it is literally a loop. Uh, we use uh, multi-threading or in some cases multi-processing. But yeah, effectively, um, every executor is just polling for jobs and when it manages to acquire one, it runs what it needs to do, and then it goes back into that polling stage, yeah. So it is, sorry, it is written in Python, right? How was this, like, reception in Facebook? Because it forces people to, like, import classes and write code in Python, and as you say, they use other languages. Uh, and also, how much, like, additional code do they have to, like, do in the executors to, like, implement your work? Uh, so sorry, the question is how much work they need to do to use other languages other than Python or? 
No, there are two, like, sorry. Okay. One is, like, the reception of Python inside the Facebook teams. Okay. Uh, and the other one is how much work do the teams have to do, um, like, like, additional code in order to use your framework. Okay, okay, got it. So uh, Python at Facebook is used a lot. Um, after C++ and, uh, well, Hack, which is our own version of uh, PHP, uh, then I would say, I think it's the third language. So this is a common misconception about Facebook that it's all, you know, Hack and PHP. It's actually not. Python is super popular, especially in, in production engineering, which is my, my area. Um, the other question is how much work they need to do. Well, we try to make the... Uh, adoption as easy as possible, right? So uh, we, uh, as part of our batteries included effort, we give them a lot of templates that they can use uh, to s get started with the framework. So I would say that it's pretty easy to use FPGA if they're already using Python. Um, there's not a lot of uh, special uh, integration needed to use it. It's actually, you can get started in an afternoon, you can have deployed your executors on, on thousands of machines and they're ready to, to run jobs. Um, of course, if you're coming from a different language, uh, we also have executors that run uh, C++ code, uh, but the, uh, the executor itself is still Python, but then we have C++ binding for calling out their custom libraries. That requires a little bit more work, uh, because, yeah, you need to add the bindings, I mean, uh, but, but yeah, if it's Python, it's pretty simple, yeah. Um, so I wanted to uh, better understand if you could describe the uh, transaction buffer uh, and what happens with the clients, how do you determine the window, is it a time window of a buffer or a buffer size? It's actually both. Um, so by, by both looking at the... Uh, buffer size and how much time has passed, we can always ensure, regardless of how much load you're getting, that you're getting a consistent pattern of writes. So, um, like, you, it could be every five seconds or every thousand items, right? So that ensures two things, that you don't write, if you get a lot of um, results uh, at a peak, ensures that you don't do too large transactions, which could also hurt the database. And it also ensures that if you have a lower load than what you normally have, you still have your save point within maximum five seconds, right? Because otherwise, if you wait too long or you never reach that number that you're looking for, you could lose those uh, results, which is terrible. Uh, so yeah, both. I had a quick question about uh, serializing the JSON. Did you have any issues with conversion to implicit types versus using something like cpickle? Yeah, I love these questions because like you're asking the right questions. These are all problems that we've, uh, we have. So uh, we actually don't use a single serializer. We have, uh, we have a list of uh, possible serializers that we can use and the list also represents the preference that we have for the different types of serializers. If you have more complex objects, JSON isn't going to be able to serialize them. Um, so uh, we, start, we actually use something called JSON pickle, which uses uh, uh, the standard Python pickle implementation, but represented over JSON. So it's a bit more cross-language friendly. Uh, but then we just keep going down the stack. We have um, a thrift serializer. Thrift is uh, uh, protocol that we use a lot internally, uh, that it's uh, basically a type, a struct. It allows you to define in schemas what your struct should look like, and uh, it keeps it consistent across different languages. And this would not be serializable using neither JSON pickle or JSON, so we have a third one. So what we do, we have uh, something we call auto serializer, and what it does, it's pretty simple, but very effective. Uh, every time you want to serialize an object, you, you take it, you serialize it, you deserialize it, and then you compare it with the original. If they are the same, then you're good to go. Otherwise, you move on to the next uh, serializer. And you also try to remember what serializers are good for what types so that you save yourself some unnecessary loops. Again, this is all to optimize at the scale at which we run. But yeah, that's how we manage it. Um, hi, very good talk, thanks. Um, Thank you. Uh, a related question to this realizing part is how do you handle the versioning of different job handlers, meaning um, old jobs log before that works for months, as you say, and then all of a sudden you change everything in, well, you upgrade the rest of the tool chain. 
How do you handle that with the serialization? Do you compare with the packaging or do you have anything more fingerprinting of the jobs or of the classes and types? That's another excellent question. Uh, it's a problem that we constantly have. Um, so every time that uh, an executor gets updated, the context might have changed from the previous version that ran that job. Uh, unfortunately, I don't really have a good answer for that. It's a problem that we are still trying to understand how to solve. Uh, we have some ways to mitigate the problem. Um, well, first of all is we try, we, we give, we tell our users to try not to break compatibility. So that's a simple way to fix the problem. Just, um, but if you really have to break compatibility, we offer some, uh, some tooling that allows you to uh, uh, mutate the context of all running jobs. So you can say, find all the jobs of this type of, of version two and upgrade into version three and in the process, apply these mutations to the context. It's very time consuming though, to be honest with you. Like, yes, it works on theory, but it's a hassle for our users. So there, the third option is to make versions sticky. So uh, you say, okay, the jobs that were started on version two will stay on version two. And, and only new jobs will be on version th three. Uh, that's easier for our users, but sometimes it's not feasible because maybe you're fixing some bugs, right? So you actually want to upgrade them to three. And the other problem is that you need to run two versions in production of the same job, which gets complicated. Because then you're like, oh, was that two or three, right? And then it takes a lot of brain power to troubleshoot when something goes wrong. So yeah, it's uh, hopefully next time I will come and give the next talk, I will have a better answer for that. 